happy Monday. Happy week two of the collective. This evening, we have some special, special ladies with us. I'm so excited. I see Mia on here already. Hi, Mia. Look at Hi. you all ready to go. Yes, oh, I'm my so gosh. ready. Oh, I knew you'd be so ready. <laughs> <laughs> I always get to this point, like midway through Monday. I remember this from last year too, where I'm like, I wonder if I should check and see, like, do they need anything from me? And then I'm like, at this point, <laughs> I was like, do you need anything if you create your presentation? I mean, presumably it's already created. So I also know that my speakers have also been in touch with um, Nikita. So shout out to Nikita, who is like the yes. speaker liaison, who keeps our speakers connected to all of the good and important things as we navigate these like behind the scene things um, leading up to our individual speaker dates. So tonight we have Mia joining us and then we have Casey joining us. And I am like scrolling through my screens here to see, I don't know if Casey's here yet, but I know Casey's not shy. So if she's here, she'll mm -hmm. jump up and down and let me know. Um, all right, so, oh, Casey's gonna be here in a little bit. Nikita just messaged me, thank you. All right, so we kicked off everything last week with a bang <laughs> and we dove right into the hard and heavy hitting topics and conversations. And this week we're going to continue to dig deep. So we are going to be talking with Mia about mo motherhood and mommy burnout and mental health. And I know she's going to drop all the knowledge and nuggets and do all sorts of good things to, I should have said, let me just continue with my alliteration. She's going to drop all the knowledge and nuggets as it pertains to nourishment um, this evening. When I was thinking about who I wanted to bring into conversations in the collective, Mia was at the very top of my list. And I got so excited when I started thinking about Mia's talk. And then I had this idea, I was talking with Casey about wanting her to participate in some way. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I could partner them together. And I just did a little Instagram story about this. And I was laughing because I was like, no one could make mental health be like super fierce and spicy, except maybe for me and Casey. So <laughs> this is going to be really good. So let me start off. I'm going to read Mia's bio and let you know what Mia is all about. And then I will let you take it over Mia. So as a reminder for speakers, I'm going to spotlight Mia or for um, our guests, I'm going to spotlight Mia in just a minute, but put your computer on speaker view so that you can see Mia speaking and not be distracted by other people. And you can have video on or off, whatever's good for you. You can have the chat open if you want to be chiming in with things. One of the things I don't think I mentioned last week, but for um, our speakers, it's always great when they're done speaking for them to get to look through the chat and be able to like see cheers and comments and all sorts of good feedback. So feel free to leave feedback as Mia is speaking and as Casey's speaking in a little bit. And with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. So Mia is going to be talking about burnout in motherhood and how to combat burnout through sustainable self-nourishment. Mia, when we did her interview, I, there were so many things about our conversation that I was like, oh my gosh, and this and that, and this, it'll like make her such a unique and powerful woman. And I immediately, and I think, you know, this Mia, I don't know if you know this part of the story, but I literally like got done with the interview, shut down my computer stuff picked up my phone and texted my friend, Laura Cathcart Robbins. And I was like, Hey, I need you to interview my friend Mia. And I need you to become friends because you two are going to make magic together. And they did their interview. And as soon as they got done, Laura texted me, she's like, oh, Mia's amazing. <laughs> so, so, um, I want to read your bio, but like what precedes your bio is just the impact that you had in my community and in Laura's community that now, like, we just want, you to be in all of our places and spaces. Thank with us. you. So, Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. You're welcome. Mia is a wife and a mom of two littles, and she works as a paid family leave and mental health advocate, writing and speaking online and advocating at the policy level for systemic change. After surviving postpartum depression and anxiety twice, and later being, being diagnosed with PTSD and depression, Mia is passionate about helping moms leave the burnout cycle through her writing, speaking, and coaching to support moms in navigating self-care and mental well-being and motherhood. So with all that said, Mia, I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you, Sarah. I am so grateful to be here and just so excited to pour into all the women who showed up today for themselves. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I have some slides um, and I'm trying to make sure I share the right screen. Okay. Desktop one. 
That's always my biggest nerve as well. Like share the right screen, not all my passwords. <laughs> um, you know, my husband who's tech support, he's took the kids outside so that they're not making a ton of noise, but can everyone see the slides? Yes. Okay, fantastic. And I'm gonna move my, um, my bubble here so I can see as many people as I can. Fantastic. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you all for showing up and for me and for you, because I know how hard it is to make the time and mentally justify why we need to show up for ourselves. And I think just by showing up, you guys have done such an amazing thing for yourselves. So pat yourself on the back. <laughs> Um, and today I'm so excited to, to share a little bit of my journey with you, share a couple of really personal stories with you, um, to hopefully help you learn how to practice, um, combating burnout and motherhood. Um, so the first thing I want to ask all of you as we kick off today is show of hands, how many of you have experienced burnout in motherhood? Let's see. I'm seeing a lot of hands. How many, keep your hands up if you've experienced it more than five times in motherhood. Yeah, yeah, like barely any hands went down. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm not alone here and I hope that by doing that, you can see that you are not alone either. Um, burnout is a very common experience for caregivers, especially for mothers. It's actually a psychological phenomenon that is widely studied and accepted in the scientific community. Um, and when I realized that, I was like, wow, we're really not talking about this enough. Clearly, it's a real thing. It's a real problem. And it's something that I want you to know right off the bat is not an isolated incident. And it is not something that's your personal fault or failing. So one of my last experiences of major burnout was three years ago. I went to a grocery store with my kids. I had my two and a half year old in the cart and my six month old strapped onto my chest in a baby carrier. Um, you can see from this picture, this was around that time. My eyes look so dead inside and my kid is so precious and cute, but I am being honest with you when I say I hardly remember that time because I was so burnt out, chronically burnt out. And I was also struggling with major postpartum depression and anxiety at the time. So this was around that time frame, And so I was doing the best I can. I didn't feel amazing, but I needed to go to the grocery store and not feeling great was kind of the norm. Um, so I didn't think anything of it, but then I was only in the, the store for a few minutes when I started to get blind spots in my vision. And I never had had that happen before, um, but I was pretty determined to get my groceries because it was the post-snack, pre-nap window of time when you really want to just like get it done and get home before your kids start having meltdowns in the store. Um, but my blind spot started to get worse. I started to feel dizziness. I looked down at my list and couldn't tell if I wrote burrito or bread and was like, okay, I just need to leave the store. So I beelined to the checkout and was, my heart was like racing and the, the cashier could tell that something was off. And she was like, can I get you a chair? And my automatic response was, no, I'm fine. I don't need a chair. I mean, how many of us like we do that. We're like sick or we're struggling and someone offers us help and we're like, no, no, you know, someone offers some sort of support. We're like, I'm good. It's okay. Don't inconvenience yourself. And then I realized I have a baby strapped to my body. I should probably not risk fainting. So I was like, actually, can you get me that chair? That would be great. Um, so here I am checking out. I'm a 20 something year old young mom sitting down to check out of the grocery store. And Long story short, I made it back home safely, but then a migraine attack hit me full force. I was doubled over in pain. I was crying, my kids were crying. Um, the groceries I did manage to get were getting warm on the floor. And I called my husband at work, which is a big deal for me because at the time his job was very much like not family friendly, didn't want him to leave. But I was like, I really need you to come home and take me to the doctor, I'm in so much pain. So I was at the urgent care talking to the doctor. I had my kids in tow and my husband. So my kids are like, you know, trying to like break into everything while I'm trying to deal with pain and talk to the doctor. Um, and I was convinced that I needed to go to the hospital. I was like, I'm in so much pain. I'm so out of it. I'm pretty sure I need to go to the hospital doctor. And this doctor was like, you're really just presenting with classic migraine symptoms. And based on your sleep schedule, which by the way, at the time, my sleep schedule was wake up four times a night with a breastfeeding baby who would not sleep. He was like, based on the lack of sleep you've been getting and kind of everything you've told me, you sound like you really just need pain meds and to go get some rest at home. You don't need to go to the hospital. And bless this guy's soul, he was an older male 
he didn't realize that I probably would get more rest at the hospital than I would at my home. And this was like a whole hospital fantasy I didn't realize I had, which by the way is a real phenomenon. You can Google it. It's like, all I wanted was to just have an excuse to go, get checked into a hospital where I could lay down and no one would ask me for things that they needed. And I could press a button and someone would come and bring me food and water and coffee. And I just was desperate for it. And I remember at this time of my motherhood journey, I would like look forward to going to the dentist Did anyone else like, like really just get excited about laying in a dental chair. And you're like, you can scrape my teeth all day. Like, I don't even care. Like you can scrape my teeth and do whatever you want, fill cavities, whatever, even if there's no cavities, find some, as long as I get to lay here, it was like, that was the best because then my husband could take time off work because I was going to the doctor. But no, the hospital fantasy didn't happen. I, I was sent home. <laughs> um, so that was a bummer, but it's a real thing. Nothing to be ashamed of. Um, but it took me almost a year to recover from this burnout. Every time I tried to get back to normal, another migraine attack would come. Um, the next time happened when I was at a library with my kids and it was so embarrassing to me to like finally unload my kids, get the stroller, get the diaper bag, get the snacks, go into the library and then have to leave right away because I feel this migraine attack coming on and I don't wanna have it happen while I'm driving. But then the next time it did happen, it happened while I was driving. And this is when I was like, nope, now that my kid's health is in danger, not doing this, we need to figure this out. I was hoping that this problem would just go away. I was hoping it would just resolve itself. And I really didn't wanna think about this as a recurring issue because what would I do about it? So I went to a neurologist, got an MRI, had multiple tests done. I was almost hoping that they would find something medical that was causing this chronic problem I was having. Um, and the results of the test started to come in and they were all negative. <laughs> I should have been happy. There were no tumors, no pinched nerve. I didn't need surgery. But if I'm being honest, I was actually really upset about it because what I was worried about was true. My body and brain were shutting down on me and I was like 23 years old um, because I was completely and utterly exhausted and burnt out. And what I really needed was real rest, not one nap on occasion every once in a while, but real and consistent rest. And this shouldn't have been so scary, yet it was because I was a mom of two young kids with no supportive family or friends nearby to help. I was also a caregiver full-time for my brother, who has autism and he was struggling with a severe illness at the time. And like I said, my husband, you know, he did what he could, but he worked at a very demanding job and he traveled a lot. And I was also struggling deeply with postpartum depression and anxiety. And I know that this like concoction of awful heavy events is something that a lot of new moms experience. A lot of us go through this and we go through it largely in silence because we don't want to sound ungrateful and we don't want to burden anyone with our problems. Um, so I felt completely alone and the solution to my burnout felt completely impossible and out of reach. And that made me more depressed and more anxious and actually really angry. So I looked at other moms around me to see like, what is everyone else doing? Am I the only one going through this? And I, and I saw a trend. Burnout was definitely a common theme, especially for those of us who didn't have family nearby, who they could get help from on a regular basis. And I just felt completely gypped. I was like, where is this village that everyone said you needed to raise a child. You know, how can I even provide support to someone else or ask another mom for help when we're all drowning? And I was just like, this is ridiculous. Like call the village, find the village, give them my number. Like I'm waiting for them, but I tried and tried to build community and it just seemed to be fruitless. Um, and this was really the first of several rock bottom moments in my motherhood journey. I wish I could say that there was just one rock bottom moment where I almost collapsed in the grocery store and then I changed my life forever and I never went back. I mean, that would be a really great, clean way to present this information to you, but that just isn't true. That's not the way my life is or was, and I would be lying if I packaged it that way. So only honesty here. So the fact is that over the last three years, I have had many rock bottom moments and many high moments. And I had to learn that a rock bottom moment is not a sign of regression or going backwards or a personal failing. Instead, I had to realize that a rock bottom moment is a part of the journey of getting closer to the woman that I wanna be. A rock bottom moment is a sign that it's time for something to change. And it's an invitation to become the next version of you, not the perfect version of you that does not exist, but just the next version of you. 
So today I want to share with you the three shifts that I made in my life in order to combat burnout and motherhood. Of course, there are many, but in 35 minutes, I'm going to give you the top three um, that helped me become the woman that I am today. So who is the woman I am today? What am I saying that you can also become? I want you to know that this is completely and totally possible for you. As Sarah mentioned, I have diagnosed PTSD and depression. I have, I am the survivor of abuse. I um, have gone through a lot of things in my life and also survived postpartum depression, anxiety, and heck, giving birth to two children. So um, if I can do this, you can too. Um, so the woman I am today is a woman who sets boundaries without hesitation, is a woman who makes sure she is always at the top of her priority list without guilt or shame. And yes, it is possible. It is absolutely possible to do something for yourself and not feel bad about it, I promise you. And, you know, again, like I just said, I honor my needs without guilt or shame. And I know what my needs are. And I know that by going on your own nourishment journey, you will become these things too. You will get to this place as well. Even though I know some of you might be so in the depths of newborn motherhood or just motherhood in general, this seems so far away, but I just hope that you can see that it is possible um, as I share my journey with you. So I want to express this though, before I go into the three shifts that your journey to becoming that woman is going to look very different from mine. And that is actually a good thing. Okay. It is good for your journey to be different than mine. That means that you're honoring yourself rather than trying to follow some formula that doesn't match your life circumstances. You are the expert on your life circumstances. And my hope today is that by learning just a few of the things that helped me the most, you'll have fewer moments of crashing and burning, more experiences of living fully, and just more awareness of what not to do, maybe what to try, what not to try, um, to help you in your own journey of combating burnout. Shift number one, realize that you are already trying hard enough. Listen, I wrote down notes and notes and notes of things I wanted to give, up, give to you all, and this came down as the number one thing I needed to make sure I imparted to you today because hustle culture tells us we need to do more, but that is keeping us exhausted and in this cycle of burnout. And one of the reasons you're dealing with burnout is because you're having to try too hard just to keep your head above water. What do I mean by this? So in many parts of the world, society was not built for mothers to thrive. The United States is no exception. I'm sure this is not news to many of you, Many of us are aware of the ball and chain in our leg, otherwise known as the patriarchy. And for women of color, we have an additional ball and chain on our other leg known as racism. And it's really hard to stop drowning and escape the burnout cycle when you have these weights strapped on you. Now, I know some of you might be thinking right now, I thought this was supposed to be an inspirational talk and now she's talking about the patriarchy and racism. This is not the self-care talk I came for, but listen, I had to go here because if I didn't, I would be doing you a disservice and I would not be telling you the whole truth um, if I didn't acknowledge that one of the contributing factors, significant contributing factors to our burnout as women and as mothers are these external oppressive forces that are reality in our lives. So what does this look like in, in real life, right? We you know we hear things like the patriarchy and racism and we think of them as concepts, but what does this actually look like? So a few examples is it's the burden of having to leave your career that you built for 10 years because your boss does not care that you don't have childcare and that there's a pandemic going on. It's being passed for a promotion at work because you just announced that you're pregnant, which you thought was a great thing, but apparently now you're seen as a liability. It's having to work twice as hard as your white male colleagues just to be in the room, but you're still getting paid less than him because of the pay gap. It's struggling to find connection among your white mom friends who just don't understand the weight you're feeling when you see another racist hate crime in the news. These obstacles are real and exhausting and common, and we cannot talk about combating burnout without first addressing the challenges that moms face day in and day out. After the pandemic and this new wave of the civil rights movement, I am hopeful that we will start to see these systems crumble and that we will rebuild something better in its place. But in the meantime, here's what I want you to stop doing to help you get out of the burnout cycle. I want you, me, all of us to stop internalizing shame, guilt, and self-blame for problems that we did not create. We have to practice responding to ourselves with compassion when we're passed for a promotion or when we drop a ball at work because we're exhausted 
or when we're too tired to play with our kids because being mom, homeschool teacher, cook, housekeeper, partner, friend, and everything else is a lot. So what I'm trying to say here is that being maxed out isn't all your fault and you are doing the best you can with the circumstances that you're in. So can we practice putting down the blame that was never ours to begin with? Can we practice putting down that weight that was never our fault, but we were born into it as women and as mothers? We have to start there. So the next time you snap at your kids or your partner, or you drop an important ball at home or at work, I want you to respond to yourself with one of my favorite mantras, and that is, I am doing the best I can with the time, energy, and resources I have. You can even put your hand over your heart, close your eyes, and take a deep breath while you say it, if that works for you. Let's try it right now. Put your hand over your heart or your tummy, whatever makes you feel safe. Close your eyes and say, I am doing the best I can with the time, energy, and resources I have. Take an inhale and an exhale and screw racism and the patriarchy. You can add that in if you want, but if it doesn't vibe with you, you don't have to curse out the oppressive systems in your affirmation, but I love doing it. Makes me feel super empowered, but it's really up to you. But yes, practice that. Practice the letting go. Practice the not doing so much. Practice the not thinking if something fell down or broke or didn't happen your way that oh, I must have just not tried hard enough. We have to release that and acknowledge the real things at play here. Okay, shift number two is become the queen of no. How many of you have seen those memes on social media that says no is a complete sentence or self-care is no? Yeah, some of you? Okay, I hate those. I hate those with a burning passion because I see that and I'm just like, have you tried saying no to your mom? Like, have you tried saying no to your friends or your kids? Like, it's really not as simple as the memes make it seem. Your kids throw a whole tantrum and your mom too and other people don't like being told no. Um, and if it's not your kid, you can't exactly say, I'm gonna take away your screen time if you throw a tantrum, so don't throw a tantrum. So it's not exactly as easy as that. Um, but do you know how great that would be though? Like, let's say you go and you tell your boss you're not gonna work late for the 50 hundredth time this week and you can see your boss getting ready to throw a tantrum and you can just threaten to like take away cookies or take away, I don't know, like something and then they can't get mad at you. I wish that's how things worked, but it's just not how things work. So saying no as a boundary and you know, becoming the queen of no, as I put it, it's a lot more complicated than the memes make it seem. Um, so in all seriousness, Learning how to set boundaries around my work, my time, and my energy did start allowing me to nourish myself better and more often. It allowed me to safeguard my rest and protect my peace, which we all need more of, right? Rest and peace. Like, how good does that sound? How many of us really need more rest and peace around here? Um, but yes, when we start to protect our rest and our peace, we can show up more as our whole selves when we're no longer fragmenting every part of ourselves to satisfy all the needs and requests of the people around us. But again, I don't want to oversimplify this process. There are a lot of benefits to learning how to become the queen of no, but it is a lot more difficult than what we're told. So I want to be clear that learning how to set boundaries for me required a lot of learning, unlearning, accountability, and practice. Because all our lives, we're taught as women to put ourselves last, right? How many of you had a mom or a grandma who always was cooking, cleaning, on her feet, never taking a break, never doing anything for herself? Like if you saw her in a new blouse, you were like amazed. You're like, whoa, she bought herself new clothes? Like this is amazing. Um, yeah, a lot of us had that. I had that. And I don't blame them for it. It's hard for us as women and as moms to say no, because we've inherited the belief system that a martyr mom is the best kind of mom. The mom who does everything all the time, no matter what, and always puts herself last is the best kind of mom. And that is a lie that is keeping us exhausted. And again, this belief system is generational. It's passed down. The roles of wife and mom they bring with them an entire avalanche of expectations and pressures from literally centuries of what men decided women should and shouldn't do and be and say and how we should look and how we should dress and how much weight we're allowed to have on and whether or not we can get a tattoo or how we do our hair. 
and all the things, there's a reason why it's so hard for us to say no. So the next time you call up your grandmother and you say, I am sorry, grandma, I will not be driving two hours with my newborn who hates his car seat to go to my second cousin's birthday party. I cannot do it this time around. I will see you at Thanksgiving. Don't say that exactly, obviously. Be a little bit kinder, you know, have some tact, but you know, you're, you're gonna feel anxious after that or upset or like you did something horrendously wrong. And instead of thinking it's because you're a bad person or because you're weak or you're just a people pleaser, I want you to acknowledge that the reason why it feels so wrong to say no to grandma or mom or your friend or your coworker is because you are going ev against everything that you were taught that what it means to be a good mom, what it means to be a good woman. You are literally going against that entire narrative. And that's a lot. That takes courage. It's uncomfortable. It can feel terrifying, but be patient with the discomfort of this process because I know from my own personal experience that the ripple effect and the benefits of learning how to set boundaries is worth it. It is worth wading through that discomfort. And today I feel absolutely liberated when I say no and when I set boundaries instead of feeling scared. And this is the woman who a couple of years ago, I literally had anxiety for three months when I told an aunt that I was not going to be attending XYZ function. And, and now it's just like, sorry, no, I can't do that anymore. So it's like, wow, this is amazing. What a self-honoring thing to do. Um, so yeah, it's uncomfortable at first, but know that it is possible. So for the entire year of 2018, setting boundaries was my focus. I didn't realize it was going to be my focus, but when I started working with a therapist, she was like, wow, we really should focus on saying no a little bit more. So it ended up becoming my focus. And I read books about boundaries and my therapist encouraged me and gave me tips and held me accountable, which was a huge piece of doing boundaries work. Um, and when I had those hard conversations with people in my life, I inevitably would come back to therapy the next week and sit on the couch and just bawl my eyes out. And my therapist would be like, wow, really good work. You should be so proud of yourself. And like therapy is such a weird relationship. It's like someone's like excited for you while you're crying. It's like really weird, but it's great. Um, but eventually the process of saying no got easier and easier because as I set these boundaries in my life, I started to have more time. I started to have more energy. And with that, I started to exercise more regularly. I had more time to actually make my own lunch instead of eating whatever my kids didn't manage to eat, usually crust from a PB&J, right? Or some mangled apples, you know, you're like, oh, I'll just finish this. So I literally just started to see the benefits in my life. And I started to be able to um, take care of myself. And I had my weekends back and I wasn't signed up to 5,000 commitments. And my life started to feel more like mine. I stopped treading water every day and I started to feel like I could breathe again. And it was amazing and delightful. And I was never going back. And that year of support and encouragement from my therapist inspired me to start my own support group last year. It's called No Longer Last, and it's a safe space where women are encouraged to put themselves first by doing one thing every day to nourish themselves. And my favorite part is our monthly gathering where we show up as we are and people share what they're really going through, whether it's depression or a really intense season of motherhood or a career crisis um, or a relationship crisis. It's just a space where we can really be ourselves and one of the things I love is how we are all met with understanding nods from each other, but also if we're celebrating something, whether that's going on a hotel staycation for the first time or drinking your coffee while it's actually still hot without having to microwave it four times, the women in that group are just like cheering each other on and it is literally the best thing ever. And it's something that during the pandemic, launching that made me realize how healing it can be when we really try to make an effort to come into community rather than trying to do this healing journey on our own. And it really takes out that isolation and loneliness out of life. So one more thing I want to say about boundaries is that they're not just something you have to set with other people, which is something we hear about a lot on social, but really more often than not, boundaries are something that you need to do with you. It's a reality check that you need to have with yourself. And I want to give you an example. So I'm a recovering perfectionist, used to have major debilitating perfectionism. Um, I graduated as a valedictorian at my university at the time, had the highest GPA ever recorded there. So when I say perfectionist, I mean it. <laughs> um, and I used to have this rule that every dish needed to be cleaned before I could call a night and go do something that I wanted to do for me. 
Newsflash, by the time I finished cleaning every single dish, I was too exhausted and my body hurt so much after 14 day, 14 hours of being a stay-at-home mom, carrying kids and running after toddlers. I was just exhausted. And then I would go to bed feeling completely depleted and wake up depleted and wake up irritable and angry and frustrated because I just was doing this cycle over and over and over again of pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. And I had to have a reality check with myself and realize, listen, girl, to myself, you're exhausted and you may not have the money and the family support and the husband who's at home to help you out. You may not have all these things that you think you need, but you need to figure something else out other than spending that precious time between your kids first sleep of the night and first breastfeeding session of the night working or doing the dishes like it was in my case. Like, okay, is this really in this season the best use of my time right now? So when I had that reality check with myself, I realized, no, it really was not. And I had to confront myself and say, oh, I realize I'm acting like I'm a child still living in my parents' house, being told that you can't watch TV until you've done all your chores, until you finish your to-do list. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a grown woman and I'm allowed to make the rules in my house and I will no longer follow this arbitrary rule ever that's exhausting me. So this was massive for me. Um, and it, this is something that I really want you to take away from this story is that the decisions you make from a place of believing that you are worthy of love and care and rest are always going to be drastically different than the decisions you make from a place of believing that you have to earn rest, that you have to earn love, that you have to earn self-care. Um, so it's definitely an internal thing first then an external thing because I realized, oh, I wasn't resting once my kids went to bed because I believed I needed to earn it through all of these things and all these chores and whatnot. Oh. So I traded a perfectly clean kitchen for an hour long warm bath. And yes, you are seeing a candle on top of a toilet. I do not live in a super glamorous, Place. I am in a tiny two bedroom apartment in Southern California. My bathtub is right next to the toilet and I splurged on going to the, um, the fancy section, candle section in Target and got myself a Chip and Joanna Gaines candle. And that was exciting for me. I'm like, I'm gonna light this candle. I'm gonna put some lemon in my water. I'm gonna make this as good as I can make it. And so really this was life-changing for me. I started to take these hour long warm baths every night instead of perfecting my kitchen. And something I forgot to point out with that picture of me in the previous slide, it was like marking the beginning of me leaving dishes in the sink and going, listen, the new rule is I load up the dishwasher and it's full. We have something to eat off of tomorrow, but everything else can just wait till the dishwasher is empty again. I will no longer hand wash all this stuff. Um, so I just wanted to show from this example of, um, you know, my, my makeshift spa that um, I thought that self-care was out of reach because of what I saw self-care to be online. And I realized that there was something I could do and it was right in front of me the whole time. And taking these warm baths after my kids would go to bed became a ritual that I looked forward to every day as I would be exhausted, as I, was, as I would deal with more messes and meltdowns I knew this bath was coming and I can rest and my muscles and like, you know, really decompress. And I would put on relaxing music and just whatever I could do to make it as nourishing as possible, um, I would do. And so this really solidified for me that self-care isn't just for people with money or resources. It was something that I could figure out for myself. Um, and this leads me to the next shift that I wanna share with you. And that is to be careful of the all or nothing mentality. Oh my goodness, this is so important. So setting that boundary with the dishes did lead to that ripple effect in my life. I started looking at my life from a different lens and I began asking myself, where else in my life am I allowing perfectionism to steal my energy and my time? So with this new frame of mind, I started thinking about my basic self-care, like sleep, eating well, drinking enough water, exercise, hygiene, all of the things that I hadn't really been able to do with any level of routine for years, even before I became a mom, because I was like so into hustle culture and workaholism. Um, but I really was like, wow, if taking a bath makes me feel this amazing, what, how would I feel if I like did all of the self-care things and tried to nourish myself in all of the ways? Um, so I did something that I don't recommend that you do. I tried to improve all of my basic self-care habits at the same time. <laughs> 
Yes. Even after my dishes revelation, I still struggle with that all or nothing mentality, but that's one of the amazing things about going on a journey of learning to nourish yourself is you come face to face with the way that your mind really works around this stuff. So what I did that I don't recommend that you do is I created a super unrealistic schedule that required me to get up at like 5.30 in the morning. And my plan was to start my day with exercise, a shower, maybe a green juice, maybe some breakfast, maybe some meditation. You get it like way too many, like how many of you, you, that minute by minute schedule, you're gonna break it down, you're gonna do all the things and then the kids will wake up. No. <laughs> So I was so excited the night before I was going to start this new routine. I laid out my exercise clothes. I had bought a way too expensive yoga mat, but honestly, I still really love that yoga mat. So it's fine. Um, and I watched way too many unrealistic morning routine videos on YouTube. And I was like, I'm prepared. I'm ready for this. My alarm goes off the next day. I snooze it for like 30 minutes. Cause of course I woke up three times that night to breastfeed. I started putting on my exercise clothes eventually. And then my kids woke up, of course, an hour earlier than they usually do. How many of you have had that happen to you where you, yeah, exactly. You, so you're like, I'm going to 5 a.m. And then all of a sudden your kids are like, mom, I'm awake. I need to go potty. I need a snack. Or they're like, you know, and you're just like, I am just trying to have an hour to myself. Oh my God. And you get so frustrated. And then you're like starting off the day instead of on this great note that you hope you're like bitter and angry and you're snapping at everybody. Yeah, exactly. That's what happened with me. Um, and I love this picture that I chose because grandma looks happy, but mom is just like, really? No, I don't want to be here right now taking this photo. I want to be having yoga alone and having a quiet morning. So anyway, I would try to exercise with my kids, but then the whining for the snacks would start, the climbing all over me would start. And 10 minutes into that, I was like, I cannot do this. I would get so frustrated, huffing and puffing, right? Just like, no. So I went to therapy that week and I was complaining to my therapist about it. I was like, I was trying to practice self-care and my kids are just like making it impossible. And my therapist kindly said, maybe try to have some more flexibility with yourself. Maybe have some flexibility with your kids. Maybe it's not gonna be exactly what you hope, but maybe you could try to just like see what happens. I was reluctant with her advice because flexibility was not in my vocabulary, okay? I was all or nothing, do or die type of woman at the time. Even though that should have kind of ended since becoming a mom, but it didn't. I wanted to work and run my home as if I didn't have kids and parent like I didn't have anything else going on. And it was a source of so much struggle and so much feelings of shame and guilt and feeling like a failure um, that was just so unnecessary. So I was out of ideas. I knew that what I was doing wasn't working. So I was like, okay, I'll try my therapist's advice to be flexible. So I decided I'm only gonna focus on exercise and instead of waking up at an ungodly hour, I decided I'm just going to wake up when my kids wake up. Let's be real. I'm breastfeeding. I'm not a morning person. Let's just go with it. Let's be flexible with ourselves. And I would turn on my workout video. Of course, my kids started to climb on me. I could feel the, the frustration building and I'd just be like, flexibility, Mia, flexibility. You can do this. And I just said to my kids, mommy's exercising right now. You can join me in your own spot over here, not on my yoga mat or you can play on your own. <laughs> of course they got upset and they threw their tantrums. Um, but eventually after weeks and weeks, they did understand it. Eventually they either would watch me on the couch and cheer me on or get really excited about it. Or they would get their own towel and pretend it was their own yoga mat. Um, and sometimes they would play on their own. Um, the beautiful thing about this was that I became more flexible with my kids and less reactive. I just became a calmer parent, which I really needed. <laughs> And my kids became more flexible with me. They learned that I'm not always at their beck and call, that the whole world doesn't revolve around them. And they became more independent. It was a win, 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 okay? It was really great. Um, and then eventually my kids started to look forward to my 15 minute workout. And they would ask me about it and be like, mom, are you gonna do Kukwa dance fitness today? Are you gonna do yoga today? Like they were so into it. And sometimes my kid would roll out my yoga mat, my son and be like, mom, I rolled out your yoga mat for you. It's ready. You know, they became a part of it. And seeing my kids do their own version of downward dog or their own version of push ups, it is just the best thing ever. And it always makes me smile. And after months and months of doing 
15 minutes of daily exercise, I honestly felt like my mind was becoming as strong as my body was because I was uprooting that all or nothing mentality, that perfectionism that would rise up every day and say, no, your kids need to not be here. The, the space you're working out, it needs to be perfectly clean. And I would just, I just shove the railroad tracks and the Legos out of the way. And I just, as long as my yoga mat fits there, I do it. I just, every single day, just practicing that 15 minutes was like a mental workout as much as a physical one. And after exercise became a habit, I decided to practice that flexibility approach with drinking water, eating better, hygiene, having a better bedtime routine and going to bed at a decent hour. Um, and I want to say, like, I didn't practice all these habits at one time. I definitely had to take my time with them. And I would say now all of these basic self-care habits, I like to call them rituals. They're rituals for me. I don't feel bad about it. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to decide when it happens. It's just automatic for me, but it took probably about 18 months. And that is something I am a huge proponent of is just like, you need to practice slow growth and enjoying the process. This whole change your whole life in 90 days thing is not real. And I think it sets up a lot of us for feeling down and like there's something wrong with us. And that's just not the human, how the human brain works. So another amazing thing about releasing that all or nothing mentality is that it forced me to practice the slow growth. It forced me to enjoy the process. And it helped me to just like celebrate myself and find happiness and joy in the current struggle and in the current journey, instead of waiting until I reach some arbitrary goalpost to decide, okay, now I can, I don't know what, pat myself on the back. No, every single day, every drink of water, every time I brushed my teeth, every time I managed to wash my face before bed, I celebrate myself to this day, I still do because it is a big deal for a mom in a patriarchal system to love herself and to nourish herself. So I hope that from what I'm sharing right now, you are seeing that self-care, it doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to require a ton of money. And I'm totally not against like buying things or getting more resources if you can, but just know that the external things do not remove that all or nothing mentality, which is a much bigger barrier to you taking care of yourself than anything else in my opinion. So the last thing I want to share about this is that seeing my kids exercise with me showed me that the work I'm doing to combat burnout and nourish myself isn't just benefiting me in the present, it's benefiting my whole family. My kids have a calmer, more emotionally present mom. My husband has a healthier, more whole version of me, which is fantastic. I'm not always like, did you do this? Did you do that? You know, um, and I'm modeling this behavior for my kids, which is a part of the work of breaking down the generational expectations of what women should do. And that is a big part of dismantling racism and the patriarchy. So going back to that analogy of the ball and chain of the patriarchy and racism, you know, one on each leg, dragging you down, making it hard to breathe and making you tread water, setting boundaries with other people was like putting on a life jacket. It made me like calmer in that water. It made being in that water easier. It kept me from drowning. And then releasing perfectionism of having that perfectly clean home, perfectly healthy meals, of keeping up with the Joneses on Instagram, releasing all of that was like getting on a boat. So I was on the water instead of in the water, living my life rather than trying not to drown. So maybe at this point of me sharing, you're like, well, I've tried all of those things and I still fall off track and I get burned out. First of all, I hear you. Um, I do not think that self-nourishment means that you will have a perfect life and that you will never get burnt out and that you will never have low moments. I have PT PTSD and depression. Low moments are a part of my life. And I used to think that it was a personal failure of mine. And I used to beat myself up in those low moments. And then I just decided that I had had enough of that. And that was really just the patriarchy telling me to feel bad about being human. And it's okay to be human and it's okay to have low points and it's normal. And so I think we need to rewrite this idea and then recognize that nourishing ourselves doesn't mean following a perfect routine every day and having no struggles. Nourishing myself enables me to handle the challenges of life from a place of strength rather than depletion. It helps me preserve myself. And in those low moments, I think you need nourishment more than ever. So instead of you know, beating yourself up over not adhering to a strict regimen, I encourage you to choose compassion over judgment. I encourage you to tune into yourself and think, what do I really need right now? And how can I best nourish myself in this hard moment, in this hard time that I'm having? So when you're in the valley, I want you to think, instead of thinking, oh, I'm off track and this is my fault. 
Instead, I want you to think I may be in the valley right now and it is hard to see the light, but I'm still on the journey. I'm still on the track and I can pick myself up whenever I am ready to. So again, I just wanna say that I've learned just as much about myself in my low moments as I have in my high moments, right? There's like this obsession in the self-help world with being high vibe and never having a low moment. But again, I think that is cutting yourself off from really important growth because it's in those low moments when I turn down the volume of blaming myself and I turn up like and tune into what my heart, body and mind are telling me I needed and how I got there, I'm able to really learn how to better nourish myself. I'm able to come back into um, the high moments knowing better how I can take care of myself. And I think that these low moments are just an amazing opportunity for you to learn more about yourself. So if you're wondering, what's the point, Mia? I've been trying at this for so long. I just want to reiterate and affirm that you are the point, that the whole point of your life should not just be how much you pour out and sacrifice for others, that it is okay for you to recognize that you are also the point of your life, that your joy, your happiness is important, that you deserve to get out of the burnout cycle, that you deserve to live your life from a place of wholeness. You deserve to be taken care of and loved by you. And you shouldn't have to rely on and hope that someone else will show up and give you that love and care that you so desperately need right now. And it's a beautiful thing when you learn to nourish yourself, you can rely on yourself to take care of yourself. And that care and that love creates a ripple effect in every other area of your life. So by choosing yourself over a perfectly clean house, over being constantly available to everyone around you, over being the martyr mom, you will become a woman with more energy and excitement for her life. You will become a woman who knows her needs and who can trust herself to meet them. You will be showing your kids what healthy self-love and self-respect look like. And by choosing yourself, you are also helping to dismantle the patriarchal and racist narratives that say that women and especially women of color should put ourselves last. So when we learn to nourish ourselves sustainably, we are able to take our power back. We're able to enjoy our lives more fully. And from that place of wholeness, we can get out of the burnout cycle and change the narrative of motherhood for all of us. Thank you so much. Oh, Mia, so good. Thank On top you. of, there's a million amazing messages that I want you to check out in the chat when okay. we're in just a minute. But Aside from that, I also have people private messaging me like, this is exactly what I needed to hear. And this is Aww. so good. So, um, I just can't thank you enough. That was phenomenal. Okay. So for people listening, I should have said this at the beginning, but I want you to write down your ahas. So you probably took some notes somewhere. I hope as Mia was speaking, there's also a ton of ahas in the chat. If you want to write down some of those. So write down some notes because on Thursday during happy hour, like we did last week, we'll talk about ahas from this week. And I know many of you will bring ahas from this conversation to that call. Um, and then we are going to, in the Facebook group, um, Nikita will post recordings tonight and we will go ahead and put any questions or you can go ahead and put any ahas in there or any questions that you have for Mia can be in there. Mia, are you on Facebook? Are you only on Instagram? I am on Facebook actually. Okay. I'm not connected with you on Facebook. So we will fix that so that you're in the Facebook group and that we can tag you and you can see things in there as well. Awesome. I, I'm having a hard time finding my, so sorry if I'm not looking at you. Oh, no, you're okay. I lost my screen. Oh. Um, but yeah, no, I know we're kind of at time. So I don't know if like I can check the Facebook group for questions so that we don't take up more time and you can go straight Let's into do the that. next talk. Let's okay. Do that. Before we do that though, I'm going to do this super fancy version of taking a picture because last week what I did is I tried to like go through and get screenshots and they're just too fuzzy. So I'm going to yeah. make you smile real cheesy in front of everyone. Okay. And I'm going to take your picture. So look toward your look up a little. There we go. Okay. I'm going to take, and then one more, one, two, three. Oh, so cute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Know, phenomenal. Oh my gosh. Thank so, you so, so much. Um, okay. I'm trying to figure out how, am I still sharing my screen? You are no. not screen sharing. And then I'm going to remove your spotlight. Okay. Let me try this. Cause I want to read some of these comments before I go, but oh, go ahead. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. Hang out as long as you want. I'm going to okay, get Casey it out. up here and then, okay, good. You can see, yes, you just sit there and bask in the glory. Oh, thank you. Um, and so I also have to share Mia didn't out herself, but Mia has not done a talk like this before. And oh, this is my first time. Oh my gosh. I feel so relieved. <laughs> you were 
phenomenal. Like you would think this is what you do every single day. You were so, so good. So yeah, I was already like, I'm like, oh, I'm like sending her a voice memo. Like as soon as we're done with this, but I'll just tell you now that that's what the voice memo was going to say. Like, yes, this is your zone of genius. (laughs) Thank you. That means a lot. Thank you so much. It was so, so good. Okay. I'm going to let you read the comments and just like, uh, be on your like speaker tie that will last for a few days. So enjoy yeah. it. Uh, thank you. And then I, I, yeah. And I will definitely go in and check the Facebook group out. If any of okay. the ladies here have any questions okay. here to support perfect. and answer the questions. Yeah. Yay. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mia. I just so, so appreciate you.